they believe Jesus is going to come back. He's going to come back relatively soon. Things are going to get worse and worse until he does. One of the best things that we can do, if anything, is speed up his return. Well, if there's any way to do that, it's, it good. wasn't actually until we started getting more socialist with our policies and some of the woke stuff starts creeping in and all this kind of stuff. Bruce Lawn. All righty, ladies and gentlemen, we have an uh, amazing special guest for you. He's going to close all of us on post-millennialism right here <laughs> on this stream. Without any further ado, Pastor Joel Webin. Thanks for having me. Thank appreciate you for being it. here. Yeah, I'm super excited to talk to you. I saw your video. What I appreciated about you is you, sir, as a fellow Calvinist, was not afraid to uh, come at the Pope. The Pope, the John Protestant MacArthur. Pope. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah. yes. You were not afraid. Let's put that mic a little bit. Yeah, who here. I appreciate very much. But yeah. at the same time, it's like, look, like we, we need to do things charitably. We need to do it respectfully. But we're allowed to disagree. If you're in the public, you're allowed to be disagree. People disagree with me. Yeah. Every, every five minutes, yep. you know, and which is fine. Yeah, you're in trouble right now. You know, I'm in trouble right, right now. now on Twitter. Uh -huh. Yeah, we'll yeah. come back to that. So okay. <laughs> for those folks that maybe aren't looped in, John MacArthur puts out a video about lo we are loser. Yeah, we lose here. down here. We lose down We're here. We're not going to waltz into the kingdom. <clears throat> which I personally, from a macro standpoint, you, you addressed it very pragmatically. I thought it was ironic coming from someone that by every worldly measurable metric is absolutely <laughs> not losing. Uh, <laughs> He's killing it. $10 million it. net worth, multiple study Bibles with his name on it, um, conferences, mega church, the whole bit. So it's, right. I just thought, that, man, wouldn't it be better if he told men how to win down here, mm. you know, outside of his eschatology, right? right? And then I think the eschatology just becomes depleting and self-fulfilling prophecy in a way, right? Uh, yeah, I, I do think that dispensational premillennialism can be. Some of them are solid, but I think it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. It's just like things are going to get worse and worse. And it's like, okay, and are you living like that? I am. Mm. Oh, maybe that's why it's getting worse and worse, mm. you know? So, yeah. So you would venture off to say, which I, I would agree with, that what people believe about eschatology, the study of the end times, actually does determine how they behave on this side of eternity. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Not not in a perfect sense for everyone. So I want to be clear and, and carve out some caveats and stuff like that. I've got a lot of solid friends who are um, who are premillennial um, and all millennial, but they they fight. Like, like they're post now. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a big part of it is the timeline. Mm -hmm. So typically you're a premillennial guy. And I keep saying, you know, dispy, dispensational premill, because technically there's historic premill guys and dispensational premill guys. The historic premill guys, that's because uh, I want to be fair and, and not straw man. That's the oldest eschatological position that we know of in church history. Mm. So that goes all the way back to like Irenaeus and guys that like, you know, saying um, Jesus is going to return relatively soon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and things are probably going to get, you know, trending downward until he returns. Uh, the Dispy pre-mill, dispensational pre-mill guys, uh, that's a novel position. That's uh, not until the 19th century, only mm -hmm. about 150 years old, mm -hmm. uh, with the Schofield Bible and Darby and these guys kind of coined this way of thinking. And the main difference between historic pre-mill and Dispy pre-mill is uh, the rapture, the mm -hmm. secret rapture. Mm -hmm. So the idea of seven years of tribulation and there's this pre-trib rapture or maybe mid-trib rapture. Um, and it's going to, you know, and like this is like le left night. behind yeah, theology. Uh -huh. Yeah, left behind. Yeah, yeah, if you yeah. want to, what, what's dispensational premillennialism? Uh, left behind, which Kurt Cameron, by the way, he's post mill. Did you know that? No. Yeah, he, for years, he like, wow. he was he was the actor in Left <laughs> Behind and he's post mill, man. And he's hardcore and he lives like wow. it. He's going to public libraries, reading, you know, books about God and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I mean, that guy goes, he, he goes hard for yeah. Jesus. Yeah. It's awesome. So I tend to have a fairly, I think, diverse palette of <laughs> theology, and I find uh -huh. all of it fascinating and interesting. But I appreciate the post-mill position probably because of the more pragmatic, practical side of what you're yeah. describing. And I don't think what you believe about these things really shouldn't make a difference, because even if the premillennial position is true, you should be living— right. To honor God with your time, talent, treasure, your, your gifts, your service. Because obedience should be enough of an incentive. Right, right. But not, not results, but, yes. but obedience. Yes. Um, so for folks who don't know about anything we're talking about, can you just give a brief description? We're talking about eschatology, which is the study of the end times. And there are three main positions mm -hmm. um, called postmillennialism, premillennialism, all millennialism. Can right. you just give people a very, like, kind of 
you yep. know, brief breakdown of that, and then we can kind of go deeper. And then you're For gonna sure. you're gonna close all of us on post millennialism by the we'll end see. of this by the end of this podcast. We'll see. Um, so yeah, so the easiest way that I could explain it, thinking of these three positions, a lot of times if you're if you're a visual person, you might be thinking, all right, there's pre mill, all mill, post mill. Mm-hmm. And uh, and if anybody's just listening to the podcast and not watching, then you know what I'm saying is that, you know all mills in the middle, and then you know to the left, you know you start with pre mill on one side, then you got all mill in the middle, and then you got post mill on the other side. But I think it's actually better to think of post mill as the middle position, which is not really my mo because I'm not hmm. usually thought of as as uh, Joel Webin. He's a moderate. Okay. I usually am a little bit viewed as more extreme, but I really think in this case with eschatology, post mill is the moderate position. What I mean by that is that it shares um, one major quality with all mill and pre-mill. Okay. Uh, so the two main qualities to consider is this, the nature of the millennium and the timing of and, the millennium. And the millennium is the thousand-year yep. literal reign of Christ. Right, but depending on the position, it may not be viewed literally. Okay. So if you're all mill, you don't think it's a literal thousand years. Okay. But you do believe that it is this... Millennia, it's this time period of Christ ruling and reigning. Okay. And by, by literal, I guess I just mean physical. Like Jesus comes back in a physical body and rules. Is that, is that fair? <laughs> well, see, and yeah, uh-huh, it is fair. I, I think that's absolutely fair. But that's kind of what I'm getting at is the timing and the nature. The nature of, of the millennium, that it's actually physical, what you just articulated, that yeah. Jesus is actually going to return and set up a literal kingdom here on earth, mm-hmm. that's where post-mill and pre-mill agree. Okay. So yep. when I'm talking yep. to pre-mill guys, and they're like, Jesus' kingdom is not just in the 17th dimension. Mm-hmm. It's real. It's tangible. It's physical. I yeah. mean, he's going to be ruling the nations here on earth. Yeah. And I'm listening to pre-mill guys, like a, a MacArthur type, talk like that. I'm like, uh-huh, yep. that's right. Yep. Yep. We agree. Yep. And then with uh but but then in the next breath they're gonna say, and it's it's nowhere to be seen. Hmm. It's it's uh it's here, or I'm sorry, it's not the here not yet, it's um it's not yet, but it will be suddenly mm-hmm. and probably soon, maybe mm-hmm. next Thursday. So it's it's not here, not here at all, mm-hmm. but it will be here, and when it's here, it's gonna be real. Mm-hmm. Whereas the all mill the all-mill guy agrees with the post-mill guy on the timing mm-hmm. of the kingdom. Mm-hmm. So we both believe that we're in the millennial kingdom right now. Mm. So right now, Jesus is ruling and reigning, but we disagree, post-mill and all-mill, over the nature. So we agree on the timing, mm-hmm. but we disagree on the nature. The, the all-mill, um, the way, you know, and all-mill guys don't appreciate this, but I'm just trying to make it simple, and I'm trying to be a little bit funny too. So take it as tongue-in-cheek. Uh, the all-mill, instead of um, already and not yet, mm-hmm. the all-mill guy has an already but not really. Hmm. mentality interesting so it's like it's already he's ruling and reigning mm-hmm. but not really he's ruling and reigning in the 17th dimension hmm. ethereally <laughs> you know so it's like he's uh, ruling in, in, the, in, the, in the spiritual sense right. but not in a tangible but not sense. in any real tangible sense okay. here on earth okay so the pre-mill guy and the post-mill guy we agree on the nature of the kingdom okay it's physical it's literal it's earthly okay um the all mill and post-mill guy we agree on the timing of mm-hmm. the kingdom. It's mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. So so we both agree on the, it's happening now, we're in the millennial kingdom, Jesus is reigning. That's yeah. all mill and post mill. But then in terms of the nature of the kingdom, it's post mill and pre mill that mm-hmm. actually uh, agree that it's not just a spiritual reign, yeah. but it's a reign that has real tangible practical effects in the physical world. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I like the real tangible physical effects. And we're going to go over a lot of scripture in this stream one of the ones that comes to me instantly is Ephesians 1, the end of Ephesians 1, where he talks about making the world right. Christ's footstool and right. all of these different things, Jesus being above every name, above every authority. Uh, so I, 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 I love these verses. Now, in your response video to John MacArthur, you also tied in his view, not directly, but kind of indirectly, to this idea of Gnosticism, uh-huh. which I think Gnosticism is so prevalent trying to make everything hyper-spiritual, demeaning the material in the physical world is all bad, unpack how how the, the heresy of Gnosticism can, not does always, but can slip into some of this, uh, this, this eschatology. Yeah. So first I'll say this. John MacArthur is not a Gnostic. John MacArthur despises Gnosticism because he's a faithful Bible teacher that I would disagree on certain things, uh, but he's a faithful Bible teacher, and he despises Gnosticism in the proper sense. Mm -hmm. Um, But the big thing that I was trying to do in that reaction video, and I I keep trying to clarify this, and for people who want to understand, they appreciate the, the clarifications, and for people who just, you know, they disagree and they're mad, 
then the clarification doesn't really matter. Sure. But all that being said, you know, I'm trying to say, okay, there's a difference between pietism proper versus pietistic leaning. Yes. Um, Gnosticism good. proper yes. versus Gnosticism. Uh, not, uh, Gnosticistic leanings yes. or, or or inferences, um, and then and then the last one I used with my MacArthur uh, reaction video was nihilism. So Gnosticism, Pietism, and nihilism all not good. N- all not good. All right. not good. All and not I'm, helpful for for young men. All right. not helpful for young men. All not right. helpful for equipping people to do the work of the ministry. Right. It's. I think it's disincentivizing. Yes. Yeah. I think it's uh, more than disincentivizing uh, because again, obedience and eternal rewards is a pretty big incentive yeah. and you could argue a sufficient incentive and yeah. I and I would agree uh, but I think it's it's not just disincentivizing a better word might be it's disheartening mm. it's yeah. discouraging yeah I think it's yeah. discouraging and I think young men already feel this like <laughs> boomers grow they, they grew up in a different world mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like they could actually afford to buy a house mm-hmm. must be nice yeah. right you yeah. know like they, you know, and it's like, well, we had 17% interest rates. Yeah, on a house that cost $35,000. Yep, 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 yep. You know, like, and, and so, I mean, it's a different world. This idea that, you know, like, I, I'm constantly trying to, to butt up against feminism and the way that mm-hmm. the church has been feminized mm-hmm. and, and male pastors are effeminate mm-hmm. and all these different things. Uh, but part of it is like, there's some young men, you can't just say man up anymore. Yeah. You got to actually teach young men what to do. And help provide opportunities for them to do it because this idea of well, uh, I want I want to have kids and I want my wife to be able to be a keeper at home with the children yeah. uh, that costs money yeah. and and it's Hello. just it is financially it is objectively financially harder yeah. to to be uh, a masculine man today yeah. than it was in the eighties. That's good. And Period. how 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 would you say Gnosticism is harmful? To, to everything you just described like the idea that knowledge is good that you need more information that you that, that right like the material world right. and the physical world is bad kind of tie that into this paradigm where you have a doom and gloom view right. of eschatology right yeah that that's helpful so gnostic proper capital G in you know like um that is actually heresy. That that's that's where you get to the idea that like the body, the flesh is a prison and it's mm-hmm, holding mm-hmm. in the soul. The soul is the only thing of any value. Yep. Like ancient Gnostics went one of two ways. Usually they went the way of like self-flagellation mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and and breaking down the body yep. and and starving themselves and all these kinds of things to to ultimately break down the prison of the body, which was it, it's not just neutral or or of of little value, but it's actually viewed as harmful, mm-hmm. poisonous, mm-hmm. negative. It's mm-hmm. bad. The body mm-hmm. the the flesh, the sarks flesh is is a bad thing. Yeah. And then some went the other direction by like, well, if the body's a bad thing, then indulgence and overeating and sexual mm. immorality and all these kind. Of, and that was the minority of some of the the old school Gnostics. So that's that's one sense of Gnosticism. But the word Gnosticism comes from gnosis, uh, and gnosis meaning knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, but the emphasis is on secret knowledge, and mm. so it's this idea that there's. Um, only for an elite group of yeah. people, right? First John, uh, John is battling in his his first epistle the Gnostic heretics mm-hmm. of his day, and he's mm-hmm. saying, no, 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 I'm not writing to you because there's some secret that you don't know and mm-hmm. I'm going to let you in. No, I'm writing to you because you do know. That's good. You have known the Father. Yeah. You have known the truth. Yeah. There's not, It's likely that some of John's opponents uh, were talking to his little children in the faith, mm-hmm. not, a, not a demeaning term, but a term of endearment that John mm-hmm. would use, my spiritual children like Paul would use with Timothy. And, and it's likely that when John moved on with his missionary journeys, these false teachers, they swept in and they were probably saying John does know these things. Yeah, I, you know, we're not going to argue, we're not going to lie to you. John was an apostle of Christ. He mm-hmm. knew Jesus. He mm-hmm. knew these things firsthand. So we're not going to say we know something John doesn't. What we're going to say instead is that uh, John knows these things, but he's intentionally holding out on the deeper things. Mm-hmm. He won't let you in. Yeah. But we'll let you in. Yeah, that's good. For a small fee, yeah. you know. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure this probably we'll let you in. So yeah. the, so all that Gnosticism thing and then what do they let him into? So it's this elite group of people given a pass into secret gnosis secret knowledge and the secret knowledge usually i can i can bust the secret right here and, yeah. and now the secret is usually something along these lines everything you see is uh is is worthless uh. and the only thing that really matters is the 17th dimension yep. and the things that you don't see yep. so and and so how does that apply john macarthur is not again he is sure. he's not a heretic sure, sure. he's not a gnostic yep. um but but what i mean by some gnostic leanings yep. however subtle they may be yep. What my point is that, um, like, so, and this gets real, but 
when, when everything's about personal evangelism, mm-hmm. but but uh, a Christian trying to start a business uh, is frowned upon. Mm, that's good. That's good. Yeah. You know, or or when when you would almost at some level, because um, this is what we did. This is what boomers did. But boomers and you know we were called to honor our father and mother, and so. Not all of them, and there are a lot of good things that came from the boomers, and so I don't want to sound dishonoring towards spiritual fathers. But but one of the mistakes, I think, of the boomers is they, um, because they were dispy pre-mill, dispensational pre most of them, uh, like left behind, that that's that was 90% of their eschatology. Yeah. Um, they believe Jesus is going to come back. He's going to come back relatively soon. Things are going to get worse and worse until he does. One of the best things that we can do if anything, is speed up his return. Well, if mm. there's any way to do that, it's it's getting the gospel out to all the nations, mm-hmm. the four corners of the earth. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they were all about global missions, mm-hmm. all about it. And now the boomers' kids grew up and they're all apostate. Mm. So so you went to Uganda, but your kid's transgender. Yeah. Oh. You, you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. And you, you put your kid in public school and, and they were taught, evolution Mm -hmm. and darwinism and all these things and you kept saying well my kid's an evangelist you know whatever it might be you know you you know excusing these things with a missional mentality so everything was about evangelism and and what i'm trying to say is it's not this or that okay the tip of the spear is the great commission to go into all the nations to make disciples and to teach them to obey christ's commands so we can never be about anything less than planting churches uh, doing the work of an evangelist, seeing people converted to the gospel of Christ, baptizing them into the name of the triune God, and discipling them into God's law word. Yeah. Never anything less. What I'm trying to advocate for is simply more. I want to do all that, and I want to see people have kids. I'd like to see them have a lot of kids. Yeah. I want to see them start Christian classical schools, not hand their kids over to Caesar and mm-hmm. be surprised when they come back as Romans, as Bodhi Bakum would say. I want to see um, husbands and fathers start businesses. I want to see them raise up an inheritance for their children's children. Boomers have have bumper stickers that say, I'm spending my kids' inheritance. Mm-hmm. That's wicked in the yeah. sight of God. Yeah. That's wicked. Um, but, but why give your kids... An inheritance, a literal financial inheritance, yeah. if it's all if 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 stuff is bad, yeah. Yeah. if the physical is bad, yep. if money is bad, if businesses are bad, if yeah. starting schools are bad, and you know, and so what I'm trying to say is, no, let's let's Christianize everything. Yeah. Kanye West, not the best example to use, I'm aware, <laughs> but when he had his conversion, yeah. which I don't know how genuine it was, yeah. but um, all that being said, I remember he said one thing that I thought was great. Um, they said, so are, are you a Christian artist mm-hmm. now? And he said, I'm a Christian everything. I'm a Christian now. everything. Yep. Yep. Right. So it's like, so w- well, there's no such thing as a Christian business. Your business isn't regenerate. Okay. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Yeah. Everything that I do, my business practices, yes. my financial models, uh, we, we open the, uh, the day with our staff with prayer, like yep. at every level, yep. it's Christian. So whether it's Christian business, Christian school, Christian yep. family, yep. I, I've got a, a 10 month old at home. I don't think that they're regenerate. Yeah. I, I, I don't. But I, I have a Christian family. I remember yeah. one of my friends, Presbyterian guy, mm-hmm. no no, uh, no wonder why he said this, but he said, if, if an Islamic terrorist came to your house and he murdered you and your wife, would he spare your kids? Mm. Or would he say that they're part of the Christian family and kill them too? Yeah. yeah. And he'd say they're part yeah. of the family. Yeah. No, he'd good. see the Christian yeah. kids right. as, even if they're not regenerate, even mm-hmm. if they haven't made a credible profession of faith, this is a part of a Christian family family, which is a part of a Christian nation with Christian businesses and Christian schools. And and the whole deal with America is that we've rebelled against that. So I'm not saying America is doing good by any stretch. We're currently in apostasy. But I do believe that the idea is not just individual evangelism of of souls, but that we also want to see our faith transform culture, politics, business, art, economics. Everyone's upset about medicine. I can't trust Fauci. I can't trust this. I, yeah, well, what if we had Christians mm-hmm. that, that, that wanted to be doctors? And, and the last thing I'll say is one of the reasons why all the institutions have failed us, and, and you might say uh, conservatives and Christians, they don't have any institutional power. Um, part of how that happened is this Gnostic peace. Mm. Um, part of the way that that happened was what do you do with, with, with a man who who zealously loves the Lord Jesus Christ and has a gifting and a desire for theological knowledge. Yeah. He knows the word yeah. and he can teach and articulate. What do you tell him if he's a doctor? Mm. You tell him, you should stop being a doctor and be a pastor. 
What yeah. do you tell him if he's an artist? Yeah. Stop being an artist. Be a pastor. Yeah. What do you tell him if, if he has a Fortune 500 company, you know, you know, would be really pleasing to the Lord? If, if you got rid of that business mm. and you became a pastor. Yep. And so we took our best and brightest who love the Lord and told him, these things out here is just shining brass mm. on a sinking ship. Mm -hmm. It's just stuff. Yep. It's just shallow. It's yep. carnal. Get, get in here. That's yeah, what really matters. And you still hear this today, guys that I love, good brothers, many in the MacArthur kind of orbit in that mm -hmm. camp, that, that'll say, you know, the highest calling of a man is to be a pastor. Wow. And I would say no. Yeah. Like one guy recently said, he said, um, he said, Pastor, um, if you had, uh, d um, don't, he said, don't quit your job being the pastor of a church of 100, uh, 100 people, even to be the king of a nation. And I retweeted and said, likewise, Christian mayor, don't quit being a mayor of a town of 1,200 to be a pastor of a megachurch of 10,000. It's good. That's it good. works both ways. Yeah, it's good. The question is, what are you called to? Yep. If you're called to be a mayor for the glory of God, then be a mayor yep. for the glory of God. Yep. But we really, ha I think we really have over the past few decades, call it boomer theology, mm -hmm. we, we have had this little Gnostic, yep. pietistic, nihilistic bent, yep. all within this premillennial kind of framework mm -hmm. uh, that, that has taken people out of culture, out of institutional influence, all those kinds of things. And then we say, see, we were right. Things mm -hmm. are getting worse. Yeah. And I'm like, you wrote the script, though. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. I think you said you said a lot there. And I yeah, think sorry. there's... No, you're good. I think there, there's a couple of things I think of. One, when you, when you start talking about Gnosticism, it reminds me in charismatic circles where people are always seeking after another word. Right. They need another word. They need another revelation. They need to go talk to the man of God. They need another conference. They need to read another book. They need another word. And it's like, right. well, how much of this word are you implementing and obeying? Yeah, right, right. Did you do the, the, the stuff that's in the word? Mm -hmm. Like, did you do the last thing that God may have revealed for you to do, that's right? Good. So I think that, that, that I instantly think of that, I think in terms of what you described with us fleeing the institutions and fleeing the arts and fleeing medium, I've heard it said, and you, you could tell me what you think about this, but I've heard it said that a lot of this was the overlap with fundamentalism influencing the broader mainline church and the the what we'd call the neo-evangelical church, right? Where a lot of this fundamentalist started kind of popping in about 100 years ago, and they wanted to flee the cities. They wanted to flee the institutions. They That's wanted probably to part of it. flee the marketplace. And the more we get people back in the marketplace, because what you're saying sounds a lot like what I've been hearing for 20 years, but seldom hearing it from the guys that were serious about theology, right? Because right. the guys that were serious about theology were was what you described, the yep. highest role. And even that we re reduced all of church ministry to just pastor, right? you know, is, is, is unfortunate because there's so many different functions. Like we were talking offline about me transitioning and, 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 and pouring myself. I have zero desire to be a pastor on a Sunday morning. I don't want to plant a church. I want to do what I'm doing and leverage my platform to build up a local church, yeah. right? And I think we need more people doing that on the front lines from business to art to media to the institutions, um, being in the world but not of the world, right? right? So that we can be that aroma of change, so that we can be that that that, that city on a hill, that light right. of the world, the salt of the earth. Well, that's what the Puritans said. Yeah. The Puritans were post mill mm -hmm. And they said that, uh, like, America, like, part of their, their vision was that it would be a city on a hill. Mm -hmm. Now, the true city on a hill that the Scripture is speaking to, I believe, is not America or India or China, but the church. Mm -hmm. But there is, I think, in a lesser sense, like lowercase c, city on a hill kind yeah. of deal, that, uh, yeah, we, we want uh, nations to emulate the glory of God. Yeah. That, and, and America has been that. Again, not saying we are currently. Right now, we're the homo jihad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's yeah. what, what we uh, export to the world is a rainbow flag. Mm -hmm. um, but in the past, what, what we exported, people, just like the Queen of Sheba, went to see Solomon when mm -hmm. he was king because she was like, your law, mm -hmm. right? Like you got all this prosperity and gold and jewels and palaces and art and poetry and but, but it, it all stems from this law mm -hmm. that is just. And one of the things you can tell when somebody is blessed is she says, even the servants in your palace are happy. Mm. Like, the, like she says, it's not like you're, you're uh, a utopian socialism, uh, uh, egalitarian where everyone's equal. Mm -hmm. No, no, there's still hierarchy here. Mm -hmm. There's still kings and there are servants. Mm -hmm. but, but the way that I can tell that it's good is because even the lowest people on the bottom rung mm -hmm. have more than enough. Yeah. Right? That's what the prodigal son says with, with the father. Even the servants in my father's house yeah, have more than enough. And that's what America was, right? It was this beacon of God's 
It was free grace making free men who produced free markets. Mm -hmm. And those free markets, ultimately, the reason why Karl Marx didn't work on America, he tried to do this class warfare, you know, the bourgeoisie versus the peasants and 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 anger them. But the problem is you, there weren't peasants in America to anger. Mm -hmm. They're like, yeah, there's guys who are making millions and I'm making thousands, but my thousands in this economic environment, I own a home, we own a car, my wife stays home, we have three kids, and mm -hmm. I get two weeks of vacation. I'm just not that mad. Mm -hmm. I'm not that That's mad. Good. That's it good. wasn't actually until we started getting more socialist with our policies mm -hmm. and some of the woke stuff starts creeping in and all this kind of stuff to where inflation went out of control. Things became more expensive. And all of a sudden, you know, all these handouts cost more taxes. And now uh, the servants aren't happy. Mm -hmm. Now the lowest people on the totem pole are like, dude, I'm barely scraping by. Mm -hmm. Now we have a real thing called the working poor in mm -hmm. our nation. But but when we were when we were in our heyday. Uh, you know, that like, and sure, there were some problems, you know, like we, we needed to get some stuff right on mm -hmm. not being prejudiced, not being racist. Those things were real sins, yeah. but there were, there were bugs and there were features. And mm -hmm. I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but my point is free markets come from free men. Free men come from ultimately free grace. It's the law of God. It's implementing God's word. And so as, as we do that in our individual lives, as a family, as a business owner, it is, yeah. in a small sense, a city on a hill that draws in even the Queen of Sheba or other nations. We're yeah. like, dude, they figured something out. Yeah. What is that? That's good. You know what's interesting is, is just hearing you talk, it, it, it reminds me, I think, the one of the things when I look at the political landscape that I think a lot of conservatives do a bad job of is, is having vision for future. Yeah. Right. And so conservatives just end up being reactionary. Right. And it's just like, ah, trans bad, ah, right. LGBT bad, ah, right. these people bad. And you're just reacting, trying to put out fires instead of leading with any sort of vision, you right. know? And so what, what I like about what you're saying is that there's a vision, there's a hope, there's, mm -hmm. there's something bigger that we could point people to that I think in the, in the current political climate, in the current conversations it's a lot of just reactionary stuff right. without driving anyone to any sort of vision it's right. just let's just take it back to the good old days and right. it's like yeah, you're right okay you know but not everyone may be with that i mean the, the good old days to your point racism and all these other things right. may have not been good, good for, for everybody yeah. and, and so, there's but, a truth there. but if we're saying but no let's go here let's go let's go towards businesses let's go towards kingdom entrepreneurship let's go towards these things i think it's easier to 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 kind of wrap wrap our brain around that and and i like that i like it a lot so that's why you're here you're going to close us on post millennialism <laughs> right. and, and part of that vision is um it takes time and i think that's part back to the the eschatology mm -hmm. is part of it is timeline yeah. um not everyone thinks this way there are you know there there are exceptions but in general so i'm speaking in generalities in general the pre mill guy uh, believes that Christ's return is going to be relatively soon. Mm -hmm. So you don't meet a lot of pre-mill guys who have a 500-year plan. That's good. That's good. Uh, Jonathan or Edwards, even Or even leaving an inheritance for your children's right. children, right? That's a, right? That's in the Proverbs. And, right. and I don't see a lot of folks Why would like, I save up an inheritance for my grandchildren? Jesus yeah. is going to come back before right. then. Why would I pay off my house? <laughs> Why would right. I save right. so that they can have a down payment for their house when they're babies and I'm thinking right. about their future, right? Why would right. I do that if Jesus is going to come back right. any minute? You know? And a lot of people have lived that way. You know, some people think it's just like we're being hyperbolic right now. Mm -hmm. Like that's not a thing. No, nah, man, that was a thing. The Jesus movement, nineteen seventy. Like you got people who were, who they, like they believed Jesus was going to come back in years, mm -hmm. maybe even months yep. or weeks, yep. even in some. And I'm not talking about like fourteen people thought that. I'm talking like a lot of Christians yep. thought that, and they made big financial decisions based off of that mm -hmm. because what you think about the future affects the way you live That's good. your view of the eschaton will affect the way you live and so one of it is do we think we can actually win mm -hmm. do we win down here and then two or do we lose and then two is not just um can we win or lose positive versus negative optimism versus pessimism mm -hmm. but also long versus short mm -hmm. And, and so Jonathan Edwards, he was post-mill, just like the Puritans. And in some ways, he was kind of like the last of the Puritans. Um, but Jonathan Edwards, he, he was thinking long-term. Yeah. He wasn't just thinking... So he was thinking victoriously, but he was also thinking with longevity. Mm -hmm. And in that longevity, you can look. It's so fascinating. I can't recite it from memory. But if you, if you look at Jonathan Edwards, you can just Google it um, and say, uh, what did his uh, kids do, grandkids great-grandkids, mm -hmm. in his family line, direct descendants, I'm talking grandkids and great-grandkids, mm -hmm. you've got, um, I think you have like a dozen doctors. Mm -hmm. You have like two or three state senators, mm -hmm. state senators. Wow. You've got governors, state governors. Mm -hmm. You've got like Jonathan Edwards, his direct 
family line, like ruled the world. Yeah. Wasn't one of his sons also <laughs> a, a, a huge abolitionist in terms of helping overthrow I think slavery? So. Yeah, because yeah. that's always the critique of Jonathan Edwards. Like, right. well, Jonathan Edwards had slaves. It's like, right. well, his son was on the front right. lines of over, over, overturning that. Right, and that's part of the deal. Is like with that longevity, when you think of the church and you pan out, you get the thirty thousand foot view. Yeah, you start to think like, okay, the church has always been shaping and 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 sharpening its doctrine, its understanding over time. Mm -hmm. So, like I would argue, it took the first thousand years of Christendom, the first thousand years of church history since, you know, the, the coming of Christ, mm -hmm. his his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, the first thousand years just to figure out who Jesus was. Mm. We're talking like Nicene Creed, you know, sure. all these councils, you know, uh, Chalcedon Council, you know, all these kinds of things just to figure out the hypostatic union, like is Jesus God or is he man? Is he both? If he is both, is it half and half? Is there a mixture between the human nature and the divine nature? Or or is it divorced? No, it's not divorced. It's also not mixed. It's 100% God, 100% man. Yeah. And we just rattle those things off. Yeah. In People in died in over that. In terms that. of trying to figure out language to right. articulate these things. Language, but also fully fully grasping yeah. it. You had all these false teachers, mm -hmm. the Ar you know, Arianism, you know, and uh, Docetism, and um, Gnosticism and all these, you know, all the isms, and and they had to fight these things off. Like that's why, you know, like Santa Claus, right? Saint Nick, Saint Nick, um, you know, he he was famous for for being generous to especially to children, things like that. Yeah. Uh, he came from, you know, he lived a mon monastic lifestyle and and forewent a lot of his wealth. His his parents, you know, were actually really wealthy. And he gave some of his wealth to children who were poor. The best thing, in my opinion, that made him famous is that he punched Arius in the face mm. uh, because Arius was a heretic and they were on a council and he punched him in the face. I did not so know that. Saint Nick, so when you think Santa Claus, think Santa Claus punches <laughs> heretics in the face. And so anyways, he That's was good. he was not effeminate. So all that being said, my point is it took a thousand years to figure out doctrine of God. The next thousand years, what, what have we been doing? I think the big thing that we've been doing is soteriology. That's mm. that's salvation, mm. right? So that's where you get the Reformation. That's where, you, like, does God save? Is it God's choice, election, yeah. free will, all these? And how does God say is is grace infused, or it, or is it imputed, mm -hmm. accredited to me as righteousness through faith, or is it infused through sacraments and relics and you know like like a, a Roman Catholic kind of view? So how does grace work? How does faith work? Is it the solas alone, faith alone, grace alone, or is it grace? Plus sacraments, faith plus works, uh, you know, uh, Christ plus saints, yeah. you know, and, and those kind of, and it took a thousand years. And again, people died over these things. I'm not saying that should have happened, but that's how it went down. So what I'm thinking is if Jesus tarries and we don't know, no man, I'm not sitting here saying, oh, I know Jesus is coming back, you know, like no man knows the day or the hour. All I'm saying though is Jesus could come back next Thursday. It is also possible Jesus could come back in 10,000 years. Yep. And it took a, I, I think if you look 30,000 foot view, thousand years, who's God? Who's the Trinity? Mm -hmm. Who's Christ? Mm -hmm. Next thousand years, how are we saved? How does that work? What if the next thousand years after that was, how do we win culture? Yeah. How do we set up political governmental systems and have legal, uh, uh, just laws? And it's like, what if it's civil politics? What if it's this? What if it's that? Like, what's the, what's the, but we're still just talking about justification by faith alone. That's good. And again, it's never anything less than that's the tip of the spear. Yeah. That's the heart of the gospel. Yeah. But what I tell my church all the time, justification by faith alone is the heart of the gospel. It's not the end of the gospel. Mm. It's the door. Yeah. But the end of the gospel is not justification by faith alone. The end of the gospel is bellying up to the table of the Lord and communing with the triune God forever. It's not just how do I get in and how does he wash away my sin? That's vital. But then it's also communion with the triune God. Yep. And in that communion, living out that communion, it's walking in the victory that he's purchased for us. Yeah. And we don't know what it's going to look like day to day. My my, my life might be that, that I'm thrown to a lion's den. Mm -hmm. But but what I'm saying is that the trajectory overall, I think it's long, not yep. short. Yep. And it's up, not down. Yep. Will they be, will they be some um, some dips along the way? Sure. Just like the stock market, the last hundred years overall, that bad boy's up. Yep. You play it uh, uh, just in eighteen months, yep. and you might might lose. Yep. So so in the big scheme of things, a whole generation yep. could be downhill. I yep. think right now we are in a dip. I'm not sitting here saying, "Look, man, America's doing great. Last yeah. three years have been fantastic." No, it, this is a dip, yeah. and I wouldn't say the last three years have been. The, I would say since the Enlightenment, I, I think we've been in like a two to three hundred year dip. Mm. I really do. However, that's coming off of about a twelve hundred year spike. Yeah. 
I'm talking all the way back, Constantine, mm -hmm. King Alfred, all the way to England. Like Christendom is, and it's like, oh, you mean those white oppressors? Yeah, the guys who went to India and said you can't bury uh, mm -hmm. the wife of a man alive with her husband when he mm -hmm. dies. Mm -hmm. Those oppressors. Yeah, Christendom yeah. was so bad. Like, no, like, again, there are bugs, yeah. but there are features. And I think let's keep going. Move yeah. the ball down the field. There's more that we can do. And it's never less than preaching the gospel, seeing people get saved, planting churches. But what about all this stuff? Can we do something for Jesus with that? Yeah, I would, I would even venture off to say that the progress that we've made within the last hundred years has been on the foundation yes. of, the, of the breakthroughs of the church, whether that's in the arts whether that's in the ability to have philosophy and education and right. literacy, these are all things that we would look at and be like, ah, that, you know, the deconstructionists, they're kind of, yeah, you know, but they're building on the foundation You're of right. literacy. They're building on the foundation right. of the, the, the institutions, the colleges. They're building on these foundations that were established by Christians a lot well of times. Said. And so I think, I think even that we could accredit the, last what 100 150 years of prosperity you could yep. you could still point back and say yep. it's because of the net positive that christianity and the church has added right. you know so i like that um i want to get into theomony with you a bit uh because that's a whole nother can of worms uh you had a really good video with mike winger about it yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. that people can go check out but let's go through these verses i, okay, I want you i want you to um i listen i'm i'm right there with you the the reason why i'm like uh I don't know. Uh, I'm 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 close to Dr. Michael Brown. He's had some debates on this topic, you know. Yeah. And I just go, man, when I hear him talk, I go, oh, this is very convincing. I hear you talk, right, right, right. And I'm like, this is very convincing. I want what you're saying to be true. <laughs> that, that, just, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. And I think yeah. it is more pragmatic. I think yeah. we should live as if what you're saying is true. Right. I think and the we've application covered the pragmatic point, side, yeah. but at the end of the day, it's like, but yeah, is it I in the text? Exactly. Okay. So where yeah. do you want to start? We got a bunch of verses. First Corinthians 15 is like the go-to. First Corinthians. That's the 15. first place. Uh, we'll get this on the screen for you. Okay, so this is First Corinthians 15. Uh, you want to pick up in this ESV, verse 20? Wait. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. So this, this is where, you know, Paul talks about like a day, uh, what a day in the life of someone if there were no resurrection would be like. Mm -hmm. We of all people would be most to be pitied, yep. right? If yep. Christ isn't raised. But Christ, in fact, is raised from the dead, starting in verse 20. Uh, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by one man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. That's key. Hmm. So then comes the end at his coming. Those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end mm -hmm. when he delivers the kingdom of God or the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. After destroying them. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, there's a very linear sequential order to these verses. Yes. That there's some things that have to happen. And then that's when the end is so coming. So when, when, when is this end coming? Then comes the end when? When Christ delivers the kingdom to God. But here's the crazy thing. It's not when comes the end, when Christ brings the kingdom to earth. Mm -hmm. No, it's when he delivers this kingdom that's already been, in large part, completed, and he hands it to the Father and says, here it is, I did it. And how, well, how'd you do it, Jesus? You're seated at the right hand of God. Yep. Well, Christ is head of the church. I did it through my body. I did it through the church, the battering ram of Christ, right? Um, th that's another one that we could do. We'll, we'll finish this one, but Matthew 16, where he says um, that, that I will build, not just sustain, but I'm going to build my church. That's increase, grow my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We always think of hell on the offense, that hell has its, you know, its dark arts, its weaponry, it's yeah. it's on the offense, and, and we're on the ropes, you know, just taking the blows, and, and we're barely standing. We, we might land one punch if we're lucky, but the nice thing is that we're going to go all 12 rounds, uh, but Jesus is going to hold us up like a good coach, you know, and in between the rounds, he's going to have us spit in the bucket and drink some water, Rocky Balboa style. And, and what Jesus is going to do is if we can make it all 12 rounds, and we yeah. will because he's merciful, then he'll tag us out and he'll go beat the opponent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so the pre-mill and the, you know, all-mill and the post-mill, we all believe Christ wins. The question is how. Yeah. So I believe that Christ wins through the church. Yep in real human history progressively like a mustard seed growing into a tree. They believe Christ wins despite the church, mm. despite the church. So, so back to this. So then comes the end when he delivers this kingdom, this progressively already built to the Father, and that's after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until. 
So he's reigning now, and he's reigning for a particular period of time until when? Until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Yeah. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. That's and good. so so all that being said, um, I think a lot of times the premillennial person, they think in terms of basically no enemy is going to ultimately be destroyed until Christ returns. Mm-hmm. And and But if you think about that, biblically speaking, we could go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 4, talks about seeing him in the sky, talking about his, his physical final return, mm-hmm. caught up with him, the dead shall rise, the dead in Christ first, then us who are living caught up into the air. And, and a lot of people think like, like Jesus is going to return when he returns before his feet even touch the ground. When he returns, the dead will rise. So death is defeated. Then Jesus will touch down and defeat all his other enemies. But if you plug that in back to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15 would have to say the first of his enemies to be defeated is death. Mm. But it doesn't. It says the, the last. last. Yeah, that's good. And so to me, it seems like like leaven working slowly, progressively, gradually through the whole lump of dough, yeah. like a mustard seed slowly, gradually growing into a, a, a tree, or Daniel chapter 2 would be, a, um, uh, Daniel chapter 2, that there's all these kingdoms of the world, but then a stone cut by no human hands rolls and crushes mm. the statue. It's ground up into chaff, blown away, and then the stone, it doesn't just break the kingdoms, but then it grows into a mountain that fills the whole earth, all of it is gradual, all of it's progressive, all of it is small, slow, but then significant. That's good. And and so to me, it seems like 1 Corinthians 15 is saying, he must reign, that is, he is reigning as he is progressively now conquering his enemies. There, there are certain enemies that, that we just take for granted mm. that, that have been conquered. Like people are like, oh man, the world's getting worse and worse. Like, I don't know, would you rather be alive today or in the 300s? Yeah. That's a, great, that's a good point. You know They're what I mean? Like, today, there's a lot of enemies that have been yeah, defeated. Yeah, yeah. Now, some of them are rearing back up, mm-hmm. but they're getting slapped down again. Yep. Like we like we defeated communism. Yep. Worldwide, nah, China's still there. Yep, yep. You know, North Korea's still the, there. You know, yeah. yeah, but there's some work to do. Yep. But man, there's been progress. Yep. Amazing progress. People say, you think things are getting better? Are you kidding me? What about Hitler? Mm-hmm. What about the Third Reich? I like what Doug Wilson says. He says, the Third Reich can be measured in a matter of months, mm-hmm. but there's been nothing like Assyria, mm. nothing like Babylon, mm-hmm. nothing like the Persians yeah. and Medes. That's good. Now, you look at these kingdoms, Nineveh mm-hmm. was a capital city of the Assyrians, mm-hmm. right? They would fillet their victims alive mm. and they would hang their skin on the walls. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the the king of Nineveh, he specifically says, let us repent from our evil deeds and the violence in our hands. Yep. Um, Jonah, people think Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because he was scared that they wouldn't hear his message mm-hmm. and that they would kill him. Mm-mm. Jonah, he literally says in the fourth chapter, he says, this God is why I did not want to go. Is this not what I said in Tarshish? I knew you to be a gracious God relenting and sending disaster. Mm. So he wasn't afraid that Nineveh w- w- would reject his message and kill him. He was afraid that Nineveh would accept the message mm. and repent, and he knew that God is a sucker for repentance, <laughs> that God is merciful and gracious, yeah. and that God he wanted God to send the, the hail yep. and, and brimstone. Yep. You yep. know, yep. and because Nineveh, here's the thing people don't know, Nineveh was one of the southern capital cities of Assyria that was directly north of Israel and Jonah was living in one of the northern ki- the northern kingdom of Israel one of the northern villages there it's likely and Nineveh had ramped up its pre-invasion attacks during the life of Jonah it's it's very likely that they had killed and even filleted alive some of Jonah's close friends mm. or neighbors or even a family member yeah. so Jonah's like not it's not I don't want to go there cuz I don't want to get skinned alive it's yeah. I don't want to go there because they might repent, and if they repent, I know you, God. Mm. You, you're, you're a forgiving God, yep. and I don't want them to be forgiven. Yep. But all that is to say, these guys were barbaric, barbaric. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're talking, and there's still, yeah, sex, sex trafficking still happens today. Yep. There are still bad things, but, but man, you go, you go into the BCs before Christ, yep. and you look at the world, and like we're living in, in a picnic, yep. yeah, That's by good. comparison. Which uh, what verse you want to go to next in terms of right. millennialism? Um, let's do let's do Isaiah sixty five. Okay, this is it. this one's just fun. Okay, Isaiah sixty five, verse first. Uh, let's scroll down, see if you can find where it says, "Keep going, uh, where the youth shall die at a hundred. Uh, then the Lord says, "As one, yep, keep going. We're we're almost there. Uh, I will bring the offspring, desire the sword. Okay, go up a little bit, up a little bit. 
Up, 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 up. Blessing, do not destroy it. No, my bad. Go down. Go back down. We're going to nail it. Hey, real quick, you can watch the extended version of this podcast on Patreon. It gets a little spicy, it gets a little weird, like I don't want to get pearly thing. So if you want to see the entire thing, meet me over at Patreon, but here's a little preview. Hey. But, but my it's my world is being rocked right now, Zach. But I thought I was conservative, man. Right. <laughs> Are most of the women at your church not working? So, like, I I believe that you know that, that women should wear a head covering on the Lord's day. But it's like so so all the women in your church got this on. Does your wife wear this on? Sunday? I said, you know what? I'm not going to apologize for slavery. I'm Whoa! Not. So you don't think women should vote? No. Why? Sounds, They're shredding lightly with the vote. It sounds so intense, but I'm telling you, dude, you look back over history, think, you don't uh, have to read it. That's starting to sound a lot like Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other super controversial views of yours that I need to know? Well, so I was with, I was talking Gosh. with a guest. My heart's it's okay, sinking it's okay. right now. Okay. You're, you're anti-slavery. You don't like racism. I am anti- Chosen, a curse, blessed. For behold, oh, here we go. New heavens and new earth. That's a great, great indicator. We're on the right track. Uh, okay, that's good. That's good. Uh, go up. Let's start with like verse maybe 19 or 18. Okay. 18. Okay, let's start with 18. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die at a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They'll plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Ooh. And it goes on and on. I Here's the that. deal, though. The beauty of this is, is um, people, you know, a lot of people say, that, yeah, it's the new heavens and the new earth, yep. the pre-mill, all-mill, post we all agree. Um, but then the pre-mill guy, he's going to say, this is the new heavens and earth after Jesus' final return. Yep, yep. But it says the youth shall die at 100. Hmm. My question is, in if you hold to a pre-millennial perspective and Jesus has physically returned, mm -hmm. his final return, second coming mm -hmm. within the pre-mill paradigm, and set up his literal thousand-year earthly millennial kingdom here on earth, who's dying? Yeah. Who's still dying? Whereas I read this, and I say, and, and this is this is just for the record, it's not just me. This is R.C. Sproul's interpretation. This is Jeff Durbin. This is Jonathan Edwards. This is lots of guys. I read this and say, no, this is something that's going to actually happen in this church age that we're currently living in mm -hmm. uh, before the final return. This is something that's going to happen in the gospel age, the church age in human history, that Christ is going, his, the Great Commission is going to be so successful that it's, it's going to change not just individuals, but as individuals change and actually live that change out in yeah. their day-to-day -day lives, yeah. and lots of individuals change, that, that affects societies and cultures and nations, and eventually that affects medicine. That I mean, lifespans have increased. Yep. You look at that, it's like people, if somebody died at 50, back in the day you'd be like, dude, he was old. Mm. Now somebody dies at 50 and you say, it's tragic. He, he was just yeah. a kid. It's tragic. He yeah. was youth, right? And, and, and what this is saying is a day is coming before Jesus' final return, when people still die, but but if someone, if a dude dies at 100, we'd say, oh, he's just a baby. Wow. Wow. So right? that, This so, is Ricky so, so, Bobby style, right? Yeah. With modern advances in technology, yeah, yeah, yeah. my high-level income, 250, yeah. 265. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we're going to see a life increasing, mm -hmm. a life expectancy increase. Physical life, yeah. literal life. Wow. Okay, I like that. I've never looked and at this verse that, before. And with that, it says no longer um, will the infant live out a few days. Mm. We've already seen medical advances. So there's a family in my church, precious family, members, faithful members. They, they actually came with me from California. They were mm. members out, out here when I was pastoring here. And um, they just had um, their daughter born at 32 weeks, Nathan? Yeah. It's like 10 weeks early. Wow. I think it might have been 30 weeks. Yeah. 30 weeks. That's early. And they uh, the baby was in the NICU. Baby just came home yesterday. Mm. Fine. Yeah. That baby would have been dead. Yep. 
And I'm talking, I'm talking like 50 years ago. That baby wanted to be. I mean, there's babies being born as early as like I want to say 22. These days, 23 weeks. But that is novel in human history because of the advancement of the gospel, medicine. And you're like, no, that's the advancement of science and and uh, the science. uh, You know, no, 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 no. Look at that that uh, paramedic. When when that ambulance drives by, what's what's that symbol there? Oh, Mm -hmm. that that snake around that stick. Mm -hmm. What what is that? What's the symbol for medicine? Mm -hmm. That's that's indicative of Moses fashioning the bronze serpent Mm -hmm. and holding it up on a staff in the wilderness so that all the people who had been bitten by serpents with poison who were sick and dying, they were called to look at this serpent and they would be healed. The emblem for Western medicine is a Christian symbol of health. Wow. Because Christians started hospitals. Mm. Christians started medicine. Christ, all these things come from the Christian worldview applied to every realm of life. Now, the last thing with the infant thing, because I'd be remiss if I miss this point, it's not just uh, the premature baby that's born that now lives. Um, but it says no longer will an infant live but a few days. You know what that also includes? Hmm. Abortion. Mm. And here's the emblem that you're it's talking gone. about. So you're saying this is this is <laughs> from from Moses. Wow. That's from Moses. Wow, that's crazy. And yeah. the, Christians did everything. Everything came from Christians. Wow. All right. <laughs> everything. And, yeah. And obviously, uh, Roe v. Wade getting overturned. Amen. A hundred uh, Yeah, well, that's messed year with ago. some people. I've yeah. had people email me. They're like, all right, so I thought everything would yeah. get worse, but I don't know I what to do with this. I was shocked when that happened. I was like, right? man, there's a lot of us that uh, just, you know. You just felt make, like it could never be. It could never be. My whole it. life. Yeah. Yeah. It's been Roe. Wow. Okay. That's good. That's good. All right. So that's what a else? fun one, Isaiah 65. I like it. Okay, what's the next one? Where you want to go next? Let's do the Daniel 2. I already kind of recited it, but it's it's a, another fun one because okay. it gets into the kingdoms. We could talk about Babylon, Assyria, yeah. you know, th- these kinds of things. Give me one sec. I'll pull up Daniel. I got one for you, too. I'll see if if, if, if mine's fit fits in the, Great. The, 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 the whole. I got two, actually, for you. Okay, so uh, Daniel chapter 2. Yep, so Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Mm-hmm. In the dream, he sees this big statue. So let's go down further where Daniel gives the interpretation because okay. he'll, he'll basically repeat the dream, but also its meaning. All right, so we're scrolling. Uh, let's see. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion. Let's keep God going. God reveals Nebuchadnezzar's yeah, dream. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so let's start with verse 17. Uh, then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to uh, Haniah, Meshiel, and uh, Azariah, uh, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from God Uh, the God of heaven, concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed uh, with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever, uh, to whom belongs wisdom and might. Let's go down a little bit further to where we get into the dream. Therefore, Daniel went. Uh, Let's keep going. Daniel answered the king. Here we go. Uh, So I think verse 27. Uh, Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, and astrologers. I can show the king the mystery. Oh, here we go. Headline. See where it says Daniel interprets the dream? Mm -hmm. Boom. Verse 31. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then the iron and the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the children of man, right? Because we're talking about Nebuchadnezzar. It's not just a kingdom. It's not just a nation. should be thought of Babylon was an empire, Mm. sucking up all these other nations Mm -hmm. into its orbit, right? So into whose hand he has given um, all these other peoples, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the fields, the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. He was king of the world, Mm -hmm. the known world at the time. You are, you represent the head of gold. 
Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, that's silver, mm-hmm. then a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth, will be even more inferior. Bronze is, is less than silver, silver is less than gold, and there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things, and like iron that crushes, but, it's, but it doesn't have the beauty of the gold. It's just this totalitarian crushing kingdom. I, a lot of scholars, and I believe it's talking about Rome. Mm-hmm. So Rome, another empire. known It's not just a nation. Mm-hmm. It's an empire over the whole world. Uh, like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw, the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. It shall be a divided kingdom which is what happened, historians, later in, 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 in uh, Roman history, mm. it began to be fractured. In some ways, the empire got too big, and, and they started uh, without really assimilating in all these other people of other nationalities and other cultures, other religious customs, and, and Rome started to fracture. It also divided at its leadership uh, level. You, you got um, you know Plato's Republic and all these different views of politics, and you, so you start having this fracture between between Caesars and and you know all these different leaders, and started to fracture, started to divide. It's a divided kingdom, um, but some of the firmness of iron shall shall still be in it, um, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom, this fourth kingdom, I believe it's Rome, iron. Uh, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with the soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together. Just as iron doesn't mix with clay. They, they, they pulled in too many. It's kind of in some ways it's like America. Mm. Like, like um, uh, ethnicity is not the issue. But there is something to be said for not having borders and anybody can come over any way they want, Mm -hmm. right? There has to be a system of you come in the right way, these kinds of things. So they spread too thin. They intermarried, all these different things, this mixture of cultures. They're not united anymore, um, and it it becomes divided and brittle. So it breaks all these kingdoms into pieces. Um, It says the kingdom shall be destroyed. Um, A kingdom, oh, I'm sorry, in those days... But they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. Verse 44 now. And in those days, um, the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up his kingdom. Wow. A kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Well, I'm thinking, so what's this fifth kingdom? Mm-hmm. That, that's not, it's not gold. It's not silver. It's not a statue made with human hands of gold or silver or bronze or iron or clay. It's a stone cut by no human hand. And, and it comes in. It shatters all the other kingdoms. But notice, where does it hit? If you keep going, the stone, it hits the feet. Mm. So it doesn't hit the head, the gold, right? Because think of it linearly, like, mm-hmm. like a, a timeline of history. Mm-hmm. Well, well, Babylon's done. Nebuchadnezzar, he's, he's good and dead. So we're on the fourth kingdom now. So the stone comes about during the timeline of the fourth kingdom, not mm-hmm. Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar, gold or silver or bronze, but now Rome, iron, and the latter part of Rome, as it's starting to fracture and be divided and mm-hmm. spread itself too thin, then God sets up his kingdom cut by uh cut out by no human hand this thing was man-made statue this thing though is all natural mm-hmm. right it's rock not gold it's god no human hand not man and and it shatters it hits the fourth kingdom rome that's divided and it shatters all the kingdoms of the world but it doesn't just break them it doesn't just um it's not like a conservative jesus is not like your typical conservative he doesn't just bemoan he doesn't just destroy but he builds mm. He breaks the kingdoms of the world, but then it also grows into an all gl- like global world encompassing mountain. So it goes on, verse 45, just as you saw, a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand and that it broke to pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay. So it worked up. It hit the iron, the fourth kingdom, and that shattered all the kingdoms of the world, uh, the silver and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. This is uh, this dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. This is he's saying Nebuchadnezzar, God is is giving you a vision of what's going to come in in latter days, mm. and and a lot of times we'll read that and we'll think, oh, it's the end times, yeah. left behind. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. no, no. Here's part of the thing that changed. It rocked my world in reading the Bible. Part of the post millennial perspective it hinges on another doctrine, which is partial preterism. Preterism is just the Latin preterist. 
past. Mm-hmm. And so what we're saying is some of these things that we keep thinking are in our future have already happened. Have already happened. Yeah. A lot of revelation is viewed that way in the post mill view. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And so yeah. we're saying it was in their future yeah. because there's an immediate audience yeah. who, who, who God's speaking to. Yeah. So for them, it was future. Yeah. Um, but for us, it's past. So when mm-hmm. Jesus says the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 20, 24, that's another huge one where he says, all these things will come to pass yeah. before some, some in this generation will not fall asleep. Yeah. They will not die before these things come to pass. And, and, and he's talking about this judgment. Like when you see, you yeah. know, the, 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 the smog and the desolation, yeah. they you see know, that as the, as the temple destruction. Exactly. Of they right? see that. You know, that's Bart Ehrman's uh, critique with the reason why he said he's no longer a critic. One of the reasons is he said, because he, you're right. Jesus was a mm-hmm. apocalyptic prophet. That right. the ap- apocalypse never came, and I was like, right. "That's such a stupid reason not to be a Christian." Because but that is a bit. That he's is talking the about the dis- destruction of the temple. You're right. That's the 24. chief one. That yeah. atheists and they sit there, nanny, nanny, boo, boo, ha, ha, and mocking mm-hmm. Christians, saying, "Look, Jesus, one of the." And, and they are right in a sense, but they're ultimately wrong. But they're like they're saying this is one of the most significant prophecies that Jesus makes in his whole earthly ministry, mm-hmm. and that that part is right. Mm-hmm. Jesus literally, they're, they're walking. Uh, by the temple, and the disciples are in awe of this, I mean, it's majestic temple. Yep. And Jesus makes the most stunning prophecy anyone's ever made. He said, I tell you the truth, not one stone will be left on the other. Mm. And that's in the same chapter, the same discourse, where he then launches and saying, and not only is this going to happen, but it's going to happen within 40 years, mm. uh, which 40 years is a generation, mm-hmm. uh, before some he does this say generation that within, within a generation. That's good. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, and then what happened? There were still some people, when Jesus made that prophecy, still alive, when the temple and they destroyed. literally went yeah. back and looked, not one stone on top. So what I would say is, is to Bart Ehrman or all the, these atheists, nanny nanny boo. I say, uh, no, Jesus was right. He made the prophecy. He fulfilled the prophecy. Yeah. The problem is that we have dispensationalists. Mm. <laughs> That's, That's good. the problem. That's good. <laughs> so. That's good. I like it. I like it. And I, you know, I even think about. I, I I I just tend to think of all this stuff as like just more pragmatic, right? So even it, when you go into Matthew twenty five and he's talking about the parable of the talents, right, which then goes into the story of separating the sheep from right. the goats, right? And the parable of the talents is, in my opinion, very clearly about making the most of your time, talent, and treasure, and then it goes right into the last days, right? So regardless on when these things are happening, you're still called to be faithful with your time, talent, and treasure. Why? So that you can care for the least of these. Right. Right. So right. it's talking about, hey, when I was naked, you clothed me. Mm-hmm. When I was, when I was, uh, when I was in prison, you visited me. Uh, when I was hungry, you fed me. All of those things are coming right out of the parable of the talents, and yep. all of those things require the ability That's and right. the resource to care for people, which That's right. we don't really talk about. Right. Yeah, we, don't we don't really talk about the practical side. Um, so uh, yeah, I like that. You want you want to drop another one on me? Sure. Uh, we we can go into um, whatever you want, or I we can go into some. Um, I, I can list some more if you want. So so tell me what you think about this one. Let me go. Let me take you to one of my favorite passages, and it's it's not it's it's a contemporary of Daniel, and uh, in Jeremiah. So again, this is more so in the in the the practical side, right? Okay. Um. So this is the world. The the the, the this there, is a good one in, in exile. Right, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, all contemporaries of each other. This is why while the children are in exile in Babylon, and so even if the premillennial position was true, which I, 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 after this conversation I'm, I'm, I'm with <laughs> you, uh, the instructions would still be the same. Right? right, even if you're in exile, even if you're you're sold off, even if this is in your land, Jeremiah 29. If we're going to parallel this to us being in exile in, in modern day Babylon, 29 verse four. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles who I'm sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, mm-hmm. plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and daughters and, and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile, pray to the Lord on its behalf for its welfare you will find your welfare. Yep. Right? So it's it's so interesting that he's telling them, one, you need to buy land. You need yep. to plant gardens. You need to think generationally right. for your for your kids' kids. And 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 the, and the biggest kicker, which I think is what you're saying, is, hey, we need to seek the welfare of the city. We need to seek the welfare of the nation. We need to right. seek what's best for its for for its um uh for its Peace will be our peace, right? For its prosperity yep. will be our prosperity. If our prosperity. nation is prospering, it's good for Christians. Yeah. 
it's good for yeah. Christians. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely. I, you know, so with, with that one, I, you know, I think you can make an argument from the lesser to the greater there because, because that's, that's Israel in exile mm-hmm. uh, because of judgment, because of their, their hardness of heart and unbelief and all these kinds of things. So they're in exile and that's still the word of the Lord to them. Yep. So the word of the Lord to his people, God's people, Israel, we are true Israel, the church, the, the word of the Lord to his people, even in a season of exile is um, take off your coat and stay a while. Yeah. Yep. Don't be thinking in 15-minute yep. timelines. Yep. Yep. Build houses, get married, yep. these kinds of things, right? And so I would say even more so, what about for us today? Mm-hmm. Because a lot of people would look at Jeremiah 20, 29, and I think a lot of it transfers the way you just used it. Mm-hmm. Get married, have kids, buy a house, yes. uh, start a business, these kinds of things, plant a vineyard, um, all of that. But I, th- if anything, I think it's even further because because... You know, people a lot of times will say, we're sojourners, right? That's another thing mm-hmm. that, that gets me. So it's like, we're sojourners and strangers and aliens. And the New Testament talks about that. Mm-hmm. But here's the funny thing. The New Testament talks about um, the sojourner, the stranger, the alien, in terms of being in, in, a, in a land that is not your own. Mm-hmm. So people who aren't actually Israel, but are but are living amongst Israel, coming in like Rahab was a she was an alien, right? Sure. She's a stranger, a foreigner. Sure. She comes in, you know, or or uh, not Ruth, but uh, um, yeah, Ruth, not Naomi, but Ruth, the daughter-in-law. She comes in, the Moabites, um, these kinds of things come come in, and then and then there's also language of being like a sojourner or alien uh, in terms of. Uh, Israel, if they're in exile in Babylon, this mm-hmm. is not your home. And even then, uh, God's still saying, "But take off your coat and stay a while, because mm-hmm. you're going to be here a while." Mm-hmm. But but here's the thing: we we always, and in the New Testament, Peter talks about you are sojourners, just you know, in the same way. Yeah. Um. And so then we get this this whole concept of this world is not my home. Mm-hmm. This world is not my home. Mm-hmm. I'm just passing through. Mm-hmm. I'm a sojourner. Well, here's the the interesting thing: the Bible also uses the same word for Abraham when Abraham is sojourning in the land of promise that he's meant to inherit mm. because it's oh that's good because he's still a stranger to that yeah. land he's it's not his homeland yeah it's not his father's land yep. he god says abraham leave the land yeah. your, of your father and go to the land that i will show you when he gets into this land this new land of canaan um the bible actually says he is a sojourner in that land he is a foreigner to that land but here's the deal he's not sojourning in the land as an exile waiting for God to eventually remove him. Mm-hmm. He's sojourning in that land as someone who's going to conquer it. Yeah. Woo! That's good. It's his land. That's good. What do you do with the Sermon on the Mount? Yeah. The meek shall inherit heaven. The earth. Mm. The earth. That's good. Like, what do you do with it? It's ours. Yeah. It's ours. Jesus came 2,000 years ago, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. He says, all authority, not just in the 17th dimension, but on earth and in heaven is mine. He plants a flag in the, in the sand and says, this world is mine, and, it, and I've given it to you as my ambassadors conquer the land. Mm-hmm. And we don't conquer it the way Joshua conquered Canaan with a sword, but we do conquer it with a a sword, so to speak, that's sharper than any double-edged sword, the yeah. Word of God. We preach the gospel. Hearts are cut. Uh, people are saved. Lives are transformed. And all of that affects ev- everything. Yeah. That's good. Everything. Here's another one. Tell me what you think about this one. Psalm 24, 1. The mm-hmm. earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell in it. The NIV says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who dwell in it, for he founded it on the sea and established it in the waters. Amen. So that's, I mean, that's, that's kind of what you're saying. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Like people say, oh, well, the, well, the world, this is Satan domain, uh, yeah. Satan's domain. That's that's so simple, but there's so many misunderstandings. Um, God gave it to Adam. Adam was set up as steward, right? I think of like Lord of the Rings, like the steward of Gondor, yep. you know, whatever. Like, okay, you're the steward um, until the king comes. Yeah. And and then you, you know, <laughs> you give it back to the king. So Adam set up as like a steward. In the world, not mm-hmm. just the garden. Mm-hmm. I believe that Adam, he had an eschaton just like we do. His was different. This is prelapsarian. This is before the fall, before sin into the world. But his eschaton, what he was working towards, was twofold. I think uh, he was to expand the garden over the whole face of the globe. Because even before sin entered the world, there was still w- wilderness. Mm-hmm. Everything was good, so there was nothing evil or bad. Death hadn't entered the world, but there were still barren places. Mm-hmm. Because the Bible says that Adam was actually formed in the wilderness, then placed by God in the garden. And so what I believe was twofold. He was going to work and keep the garden. Keep meaning protect, defend. Work meaning nourish, 
nurture, but in that, increase and expand the garden, and then also be fruitful and multiply. So he's going to multiply image bearers and also expand their their habitat, yep. their environment. Yep. So that if he had achieved his eschaton, and then also defend, that means kick the serp- serpent's butt out of the garden yeah. and don't let him talk to your wife. Yep. He didn't you know. do that. He didn't do that, yeah. right? I, I'm just thinking I'll probably get on tr- yeah. trouble on, on Twitter for saying that. You, like, <laughs> you, you you control who talks to your wife. Um, yeah, in some cases. Yeah, yeah, in some cases. So, anyways, all that being said, that was his eschaton. Well, here's the deal: it's God's world. He gave it to Adam. Adam gave it to Satan. Yeah. And in that sense, it really was Satan's world. That's why when people think, you know, people say this, you know, like with Christian nationalism, I, you know, I, I get a lot of flack with the Christian nationalism conversation. I was part of a statement on, on the statement on uh, Christian nationalism and the gospel and all those kinds of things. But um, people say, you know, this world is not our home. That that's a, that's one of my favorites. That's a classic. They'll also say, um, um, oh, they'll, they'll say they'll say this. They'll say um, uh, this is Satan's domain, um, and and they'll say Jesus had an opportunity. If he really cared about being king, he had an opportunity. Satan tempted him in the wilderness, mm-hmm. three temptations. One of them was, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus said no. Um, so so Jesus isn't really interested in political kingship. Mm-hmm. And what I always tell people is, uh, yeah, Jesus was not interested in Satan giving it to him because Jesus planned to take it. Mm. When Satan offers this to Jesus, this isn't um, this isn't a fake offer. God gave it to Adam. Adam gave it to Satan. When Jesus knows Satan, in this sense, he's not lying. He is a liar and a mm-hmm. deceiver. But but he knows Satan is saying, "This these are my kingdoms." Mm. So like like in in the book of Daniel, elsewhere, where an angel comes to Daniel and says, "Sorry, I got held up because I was battling with the prince of Persia." He's talking about Satan ruled the whole world, mm-hmm. and then certain watchers, fallen angels, watchers that chose to rebel with Satan. Satan appointed them as as actually you think of principalities. The prince is the watcher, the fallen angel. The principality is a region, an area. There was uh, regions, whole regions, the whole globe was covered mm-hmm. with different principalities, just like like provinces in Canada or states, you sure. know, in the U.S. and and different watchers, different angels, fallen angels that Satan set up over them. Um, Satan's in charge. It's his world. So God gave it to Adam. Adam gives it to Satan. But then Satan says, if you just worship me, if you commit idolatry, Jesus, then then I'll, you know, I'll give you the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jesus isn't saying, hey, I'm not interested in the world. I just want to save a handful of people mm-hmm. so that we can sit on clouds right. and sing love songs. Right. Right, right, right. No, no, no. Jesus is saying, I'm not going to take the easy way. You don't need to give me the world. I'll take it. Mm. And he does by his death mm. and resurrection and ascension. And when he ascends, he says, all authority on earth. Oh, that's good. Because it really is all authority on earth. Oh, because he good. took it back yeah. from Satan. Jesus told a parable. He said, how do you plunder the house? Mm. Don't you have to first go in and bind the strong man? Mm. Satan is the prince of this air. Mm. He was. He was the strong man. Wow. Jesus came into the house. Yeah. He bound the strong man. Yeah. And now his body, hands and feet, the church is plundering the house. Yep. One salvation at a time, one business at a time, yep. one nation at a time, one law at a time, one see you later row at mm. a time. Like, That's hashtag, good. you win down here. That's good. That's you good. win. Okay. When I'm fired up to go back <laughs> into my life and conquer the world, my, my immediate thought on this goes, what is the distinction between this and what I hear from my hyper charismatic friends over mm, at Bethel, good question. over at Hillsong, this, Let's this talk about that. similar post millennial vibe, right? And and or, um, what's also the distinction between this and and uh, the, the prosperity guys? Because right. the prosperity guys are kind of coming off post mill sometimes, yep. right? Yep. And so, um, which I think, if I'm honest with you, like I've always appreciated that about them, like the Seven Mountain Mandate, right? But right. I've never had like a healthy theological bridge of some of the things I kind of knew instinctually to be Mm -hmm. like, man, this God just doesn't seem like he just checked out, you know? Um, And so, so far what we've covered is we've covered that uh, Adam handed the world over to Satan. Yep. Um, Jesus is offered the world by Satan. Um, yep, he did, did die. In a real sense, Satan, um, the God of this world. Right. But then in dying on the cross... And 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 uh, tying the straw man, strong man, right? Uh-huh. Yep. Uh, Jesus takes it back, and and is establishing a progressive kingdom on earth. 
yes. on this side of eternity. Gradually over time, not Gradually suddenly. over time, not suddenly. This is different from the typical premillennial or amillennial view. Uh, and in the premillennial where they're waiting for like a literal rapture, this is different right. than that. This is uh, the postmillennial view, which you've named Jonathan Edwards, you've named Puritans, uh, Charles Spurgeon. I think was also Charles Spurgeon. It, it depends, but he he it depends. There's a lot of he guys didn't really throughout declare history. much. Yeah. He, honestly, he didn't touch eschatology a whole yeah. lot. But there are some bona fide, legit Charles Spurgeon quotes where he literally says in one one instance he says um, he believes that uh, at the end of it all, yeah. the end of human history, there'll be more people in heaven than hell. Come on, because he said uh, I cannot see uh, that Christ. Um, who is victorious would allow Satan yeah. to have that final. I love laugh. that. I love that. What about uh, C.S. Lewis? I don't know about Lewis. I think C.S. Lewis leaned, leaned maybe Smill. Yeah, yeah, you might um, be right. I'm trying to think who else. I feel like there's other guys. R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul. That's right. Uh, Doug Wilson. I like Doug yeah. Wilson a Doug lot. Doug Wilson, Jeff Durbin, Jeff James Durbin. White. Yeah, some them. of the more modern names. Yeah, that, those that are the modern guys. But yeah. Jonathan Edwards, the Puritans. I mean, all the Puritans, not yeah. all of them, but the majority of the Puritans Held this were post millennial. Post millennial position. The first, you know, if we're talking like uh, church history and, and backing up, Athanasius, they would call him, you know, the patron saint of mm-hmm. post mill. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. what a post mill would call him. Yep. Uh, but he was arguably the first post millennial guy. And he would be, I think that would put him, I can't remember, it's somewhere between 80 and. It would put the post-millennial position within 80 to 150 years after the historic uh, pre-millennial position. So in order, it'd be historic pre-mill would be the earliest eschatology, 80 to 150 years after that, post-mill, a little bit after that, all-mill, and then all the way 1850, Mm -hmm. left behind. Got you. And and, and all-mill usually... Uh, would be what uh, Catholic Church would be all mill, uh, Eastern Orthodox Church would be considered all mill. Is that kind of their eschatology? If we just had to simplify it, maybe, yeah. maybe I don't know enough about their eschatology. I just did a series on EO, but I didn't, I didn't hit the eschatological route. Okay, no so worries. I'm not okay, sure. so uh, all mill sounds right. If you can give me a simple, like, what is the difference between this and some of the stuff we've heard from the hyper charismatics? Um, regarding the seven mountain mandate, the right. Bill Johnson types, obviously Bill Johnson flows in some weird other heresies um, that that are problematic in terms of some of his views. But what is the difference between what you're describing and folks from the hyper charismatic or the prosperity word of faith position? Right. Um, so first, I'll start with the prosperity gospel. <clears throat> the prosperity. This is the illustration I'll, a lot of times use with like my church. I'll say um, the equivalent of the prosperity gospel would be like if I taught my kids, um, when you turn 18, if you buy a lotto ticket every Friday on your way home from work and you play the same numbers and and you, you know, you tap your ruby red slippers three times together, you know, and and you you just hope and you wish and you have faith and your faith and blah, blah, eventually you'll win and you'll be rich. Mm. That, that would be like the prosperity gospel. If I tell my kids, on the other hand, uh, if you work hard yeah. and you're faithful and you don't get divorced, that's one of the biggest ways people lose wealth. That's by right. the way, that's right. divorce. That's right. Uh, you don't get divorced. You keep. You, you marry someone, and you remain faithful to the wife of your youth. You keep your wedding vows. You love your kids. You use uh, integrity in your business practices. This and that. Uh, you fear the Lord. Um, over the course of forty years, you'll have some degree of wealth, which is true. Yeah, which is true. Right, which yeah. is true. So my point is. The Bible condemns the prosperity gospel as the heresy that it is. The Bible does not condemn, however, um, work ethic. Yeah, or, or, or the book of Proverbs. Right. The or the parable of the of, talents. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right, so like we've gotten to the point where we've become so, I think, so sensitive to the prosperity gospel that like, if I just say something as simple as this, obedience brings blessing. Mm. People are like, whoa, dude, what do you mean by that? And, and what I would say is, um, true obedience, which can only stem from a changed heart by grace through faith in Christ, true obedience, which stems from faith, um, brings guaranteed eternal blessing, mm-hmm. that is eternal life with Christ, not because obedience earns eternal life, but faith does, and true obedience only comes about from a heart of faith. Yep. So obedience brings blessing. But also, I would say that ordinarily obedience will bring tangible, practical blessing in yeah. this life. Yep. Now, you can be obedient to Christ and live in North Korea mm-hmm. and be poor. That's good. That's good. So I'm not Cause, saying cause, there's no, no yeah. caveat here. We're, we're talking about 
principles and not promises. Right. Generally speaking, when we're reading the Proverbs, we have to read it in context of all the wisdom literature, in context of Job, in context of sometimes bad things happen to good people, in context right. to, hey, if you're in a system that's corrupt, like North Korea, like China, communism, you're not allowed to be Christian, right. then, then these principles of reap what you sow, right? These things may not apply to you because the system is not set up to allow the righteous to flourish. Right. That's is that, right. Exactly. Is that a good way to look at it? Exactly. And the reason why our system is better set up, yeah. now we're, we're making uh, some not mistakes, perfect, yeah. but better set up for that, right? That's why everybody wants to come to America, yep. right? Everybody has wanted to come to America historically because they're like, the, you know, the American dream. It's like, I can work hard and and things don't get taken from me. The police mm-hmm. aren't taking bribes, you know, and pulling yep. me over and yep. beating me up with a stick and taking my wallet. Like, yep. like I've got a shot. Yep. Like, People aren't coming to America. Well, now they are, sadly. But but let's say let's back up, you know, like maybe, you know, 15, 20, 25 years. People weren't coming to America for a handout. Mm-hmm. They were coming to America for for a fair and uh, equal opportunity. Yep. Not equal outcome, but yep. equal opportunity. That's good. that's good. And that's because of the Christian worldview. Come on. The Christian worldview doesn't give, it's not socialism, it doesn't give everybody an equal outcome, but yep. it does give them an equal opportunity. That if you work hard, if you're honest, if you're this, if you're that, yeah. then... Uh, then generally, like you said, not guaranteed promise, but general principle, yeah. generally things will go well yeah. for you. So the Bible teaches that. The Bible absolutely, like, look at the end. Yeah. Thou sluggard, uh, mimic his ways. Yeah. Blah, blah. The Bible, I mean, example after example, God will not be mocked. A yes. man reaps what he sows. Yes. And not just eternally, but on, but on, on in, this side of eternity. On this side of, That's good. So all that being said, I think we've got to have better language and, and and a distinction between the prosperity gospel and and what I would just say is the Bible yeah. that um, if we if we say the big distinction is this uh, the prosperity gospel is it's uh, manifesting mm-hmm. it's it's um, it's it's wishful thinking mm. it's um, the prosperity gospel is not uh, working hard and experiencing good outcomes the prosperity gospel is about believing hard. Wishing hard, mm. hoping hard, mm. and that, that Jesus, like a genie and a lamp, will just make it happen. That's good, right? So, like a lot of times, what you know, what guys, discernment ministers, like Justin Peters is a friend, and I've done stuff with him. Like uh, what he would say about you know the prosperity guys is it's it's um it's not even faith in Jesus, it's faith in your faith, believing I have enough belief, and then the end is never Christ. Yep. Uh, he's not the treasure hidden in the field. He's not the pearl of great worth. Jesus is a means to some other end. Whereas within postmillennialism, we're not saying I want to use Jesus uh, to become a successful business owner. No, no, no. I want to be a successful business owner to honor and glorify that's Jesus. Good. Yeah, like that's different. And the way I'm going to become a successful business owner isn't through faith in my faith and manifesting it by yep. wishing. Yep. Um, it's going to be by looking at the whole Bible and the Proverbs, especially, and and obeying these things. Yep. Yep. Being a hard worker, yep. being honest, being yep. this, being like. Yeah. Yeah, the the, the how the, the how matters to God. Yes, how you do these things, right? And so God's ways and and God's wisdom in the Proverbs is going to impact how we operate with how all the things that we're entrusted with. And if right. we handle our our time, talent, treasure God's ways, then there's usually blessing in that, but not always. Princi- right. Principles, right. not exactly. promises. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's a good. good. Way to say it. Okay, so a question from the chat on our Patreon says, "How does the Great Tribulation fit in this viewpoint?" Right. It sounds like the Great Tribulation is answered by the preterist view of yep. Scripture, meaning that when you're looking at Matthew 24, you're looking at the gloomy parts of Revelation, in the post-millennial position, those things have literally happened. Um, not all of Revelation has happened, but right. a lot of Revelation lot of has happened in the post-millennial view, with, um, specifically with Nero, uh, yep. With the six six six, a lot of guys would say Nero is the beast. R.C. Sproul yeah. thought that the the destruction of the temple is right. what Jesus is talking about. Matthew twenty four would yep, be the all destruction. Of discourse. Mm-hmm. So so it's just the the answer to the great tribulation in this viewpoint would be a lot of that. That a lot happened. of that has happened. That it was a local judgment, and one of the ways that we know that is uh, because Jesus literally says, "Flee mm. when you see like the, like the coming of the great desolation." Run. Well, how, how do you run from a global judgment? Mm. Because we have other texts that say, like, you know, people will go into the caves and the rocks, cry out for the rocks to fall on them to yep. hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. Like like this final, there is a final consummation to human history. Mm-hmm. There is a final physical return of Jesus, and with it there is a final judgment of the wicked from which there will be no escape. Yep. 
But but then there's also many tribulation texts like Matthew 24, um, where one of the ways that you can tell, right? And this is the hard thing. The hard thing with postmillennialism within this partial, not hyper preterism, but a partial preterist view, meaning some things are fulfilled and other things aren't. Right? We're, there's still some stuff we're waiting for, yep. like Jesus to come back, the dead to raise, those kind of things. Sure. So we're not saying it's all over. That'd be super depressing if if like if it was all over and this is just it. Um, so we're waiting for some things. Well, how do you know if it's talking about the final physical return of Christ or or this AD? The reason I keep saying final, because people say second coming, second mm-hmm. coming, and I get that. The reason I say final, not second, is because Jesus came once in his incarnation, life, death, resurrection, ascension. And then the partial preterist view technically believes that Jesus came a second time, the parousia, that his second coming was AD 70. And, Whoa, and, okay. and so in AD 70, Jesus came, seated at the right hand of the Father, but he came spiritually. So not physically, but it was a legitimate coming of Christ. Josephus, a late great you know, Jewish historian who was not a Christian, he was not a believer, uh-huh. but, but he even said, and this is from like, I think it's like, 18, 19 eyewitness accounts that he Mm -hmm. interviewed people talking to to Jews that were in Jerusalem when it was sacked, when it fell and was destroyed and the temple was was decimated. Mm -hmm. And he said, what did you see? And they saw like Joel chapter two, um, the first half, young, you know, young men will, will dream dreams, old men see visions, or I, I got it backwards, you know, sons and daughters prophesy. But the second half is uh, clouds and billows of smoke, the mm-hmm. sun turned to blood, you know, these kinds of things. Well, the first half of Joel 2, Peter says this is fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. Mm. The second half of Joel chapter 2, though, the clouds, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. The clouds, Isaiah talks about this, Ezekiel talks about this. When the Old Testament talks about clouds, Clouds signify um, not heaven and 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 angels playing harps that look like babies. No, it, it signifies judgment. So the first half of, mm. of Joel chapter 2 mm-hmm. is I'm going to pour out my spirit. Boom, that's Acts chapter 2, Pentecost. The second half of this prophecy in Joel chapter 2 isn't 2,000 years later mm. after Pentecost. It's in the same generation. It books in, bookends this generation. First, uh, first uh, beginning of the generation is pouring out my spirit. End of that same generation is even with uh, Christ's coming, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, and his apostles pouring out his spirit, uh, the church, prophecy, healing. With all that, you still have hardened your heart, you stiff necked people. And now the clouds and billows of smoke are coming. The second half of Joel chapter two. And here's the thing Josephus, he's interviewing these guys. And, and there, I'm telling you, there were over a dozen accounts from what I've read. Eyewitnesses, they said that there was so much dust and smog and smoke in the air from all you know these buildings and fires and stuff like that. You know, destruction, mayhem. Um, but what they saw was it, the, the smoke was so intense it blotted out the sun. It was like it was almost like nighttime. But they could see the sun, be, you know, behind the clouds, so they could see silhouettes. Mm-hmm. And the silhouettes that they saw, people were literally shouting, uh, "Chariots, mm-hmm. chariots!" Mm. Like when Isaiah was taken up. The Father and the chariots, uh, they were seen like fire chariots going back and forth and angel silhouettes in the clouds. And so my point is, Jesus' final physical return, that which is in our future, not just their future, but our future still to this day, the reason I say final and not second is because I believe there's a real sense, and this is the post-mill view, the partial preterist post-mill view, that Jesus actually has already come a second time spiritually. He came physically the first time. Mm -hmm. He'll come physically the final time. He came spiritually with angels on the clouds bringing judgment, but that was not a global judgment. It was a local judgment. So when we read read different texts in the Scripture, the way that I would answer the, the question about tribulation, how do we know this and how do... What I would say is that the the number one thing to look for is, um, is this the kind of judgment that you can escape? Mm. Does Jesus say, quick, run, mm. Mm. don't grab your cloak. If you go yeah. fast, you have enough yeah. time. Just get out of there. Right. If, if it's that kind of language, so, so back up a few verses, go forward a few verses, get the context. If the context makes it seem like it's an escapable judgment, mm-hmm. that it's a local judgment, um, then that is a tribulation wow. that is already passed fulfilled and probably is, in 87. And this is multiple people hold this position yes. that, that Jesus came spiritually in 8070. Yep. And would that be when he's establishing his kingdom? Or like when does that start? Or is that right. kind of the mysterious part? That's so that's where there's some debate. Like okay. so a lot of all mill guys, you know, w- would say um it's it's from the resurrection, uh, you know, uh, ascension. 
some post mill guys, not all, a lot of them would also say resurrection, but some post mill guys would quibble and say that the kingdom was inaugurated and started up on AD 70. But the, the best way to look at it, I think what most post mill guys will agree with this, is that's really an overlap. What you have is you have you have the old covenant wrapping up and, and is finally wrapped up and finished in AD 70. You have the new covenant in, inaugurated in this kingdom, this new millennial kingdom that we're in right now mm-hmm. um, around, you know, AD 30 something mm-hmm. in Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension. Yeah. So you have this new thing kicking off, and, and then the old thing is, is it's done. I mean, it's already done. When, when Jesus says it is finished, it, it's done. So after his death and resurrection, that's why, you know, the apostles, like the author to the Hebrews says, um, you know, like, like blood, the, the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. Like, don't go back to Jerusalem. That, that's crazy. Hebrews 10 talks about, um, but for those who go back, he, and and you always read Hebrews. You're like he's saying those who go back to Judaism, mm-hmm. animal sacrifices, the mm-hmm. temple, sure. the, the rituals um, that that there's going to be judgment there because they're not trusting in Jesus. And he, he's talking about eternal judgment. Yes, but I think there's another layer. The other layer is he's saying if you go back to Judaism with these animal sacrifices, it requires you to go back to the temple. Mm. And if you go back to the temple, most post mills they date the writing of Hebrews around 80, 67, 68. Mm-hmm. If you go back to the temple. That thing's about to get sacked, mm. and there's literally going to be fire. And so, so all that being said, if you look, part of it happened deals with datings of when was Revelation? Mm-hmm. Was this written before eighty seventy? Mm-hmm. I would say it is because Revelation. One of the things is it talks about the temple. Mm-hmm. It literally says, "Go and measure the temple." Mm. How do you measure something that's already destroyed? Mm. You know. So I think like John, that you know, uh, that, that he's getting a revelation from Christ, caught up into heaven, into the, yeah. this third heaven. And he's getting a revelation to write down that people are going to know what it means. And the reason why he does numbers and stuff, we're like, oh, you know, what's the the cryptic and you know decoding yeah. uh, Da Vinci code, whatever. Like, no, look, it, it's it's obscure enough to where it wouldn't it wouldn't uh, tick clue clue in the Romans, mm. but it was clear enough to where Jewish Christians would be able to read John's letter, Revelation get the clue, know what this number was signifying, Nero, and they'd be able to escape the judgment, mm. a local judgment. So all that being said, Hebrews chapter 10, it, you know, there's a local judgment. There's, you know, and and yes, there's eternal sense there too, but all that being said, my point is just, yeah, man, I, I think that like the, the post mill view is kingdom kicks off like around 80, 30, what Jesus' death, his resurrection, his ascension, but but the end, the wrapping up the, of uh, like a like a garment, like a scroll. Peter yeah. talks about this of the old age, is not fully complete until eighty seventy. So there's this overlap moment where one one covenant is winding down, mm-hmm. a new age is ramping up, and it finally ends with a a coming of Christ. It's a spiritual coming, but it's a coming nonetheless. And I think you know all these texts, not all, but a lot of these texts that you would look at. Like Matthew 24, where Jesus says, I'm coming, mm-hmm. and this thing's going to go down. I think he's talking about his spiritual coming in AD 70. And if he's not, if you do think that this is the final end, it's a secret rapture, there's a lot of people who thought Jesus also says, uh, you know, woe to those who are in, in marriage, mm-hmm. you know, or, or uh, with child in those days. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the reason he's saying that, he's talking about women who are pregnant, literally trying to run away from mm-hmm. literal fire in mm-hmm. a literal town yeah. locally, Jerusalem. But it, you know how many people bought into the Dispy pre mill thing? Um, who li- literally, um, again, it's this is not a small sliver of people. You you can talk to people in the Jesus movement from the 1970s. You can talk to a bunch of hippie Christians yeah. still alive today uh, that, that'll say, Yeah, we never had kids. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because I Jesus mean, told us not to. Chuck Smith, uh, Mike Winger has a video about this. Chuck Smith kind of predicting the yeah. return of Jesus in the yeah. 80s. You know, and Mike Winger's a Calvary guy. So right, right. this is some goofy things done, definitely. Right. With, with I, I don't Again, I don't want to generalize all pre-mill right. folks. Right. Well, we're there's not a, saying it's yeah. heresy. Yeah. I'm saying it's. I think it's wrong. Yeah. And you would say that— But that, that doesn't mean it's heresy. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. And I was just going to say, I've had, I've had some friends say that, like, churches have been divided over this, and yeah, yeah, yeah. folks have split over this. How strongly do you think that this is a— this isn't inessential to you. This isn't uh, you would you wouldn't categorize it as heresy. This is right. just something that, um, how, yeah. How would you categorize this th- th- theologically? Yeah. So I think that there there are very few things within the eschatological realm of of systematic theology that that would qualify as heresy. Now, ironically, one of them would be on the post mill side. Um, I think that hyper preterism is a heresy. Mm. Hyper or full preterism 
is uh, believing that um, every everything is already happened. Uh-huh. Yep. That that the resurrection of the dead has already happened, mm. right? Because we just are, missed it. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we missened it all. Like that it happened. Did that happen also in eighty yeah. seventy? That tombs were open. And these ah, were done, okay. But that this is pretty much it. Um, that, wow. You know, and that there's not going to be um, depending on now there are different iterations, but there are sure. some hyper preterists that would deny a future physical return of Christ. Okay. They would deny a final judgment of the wicked and uh, and a final resurrection. Yeah. And so I would say that uh, I, I believe that that actually is yeah. a heresy. Um, but, dis- but but in terms of fellowship... Dispensational pre mill that's yeah. not a heresy. Yeah. All mill is not a heresy. Yeah. Historic pre mill definitely not a heresy. And post mill, you know, partial preterist post mill and other iterations of post mill yeah. um, are, are not a heresy. In terms of fellowship, though, what you're getting at, I do think it's worth dividing over. Really? Not as a friend. Um, but as a church? As a local church. Wow. And this is why. Um, in the same way that I, I don't think it's helpful for like half of the elders of a church to be Arminian and half of them to be Calvinist. Mm-hmm. Because it's confusing. Mm-hmm. When you're teaching about salvation, you're teaching about the sovereignty of God, you're teaching about this, teaching about that, Like people get confused. Sure. What, what is it? Do I choose God? Does he choose me? Which mm-hmm. one? Mm-hmm. And and I think likewise with eschatology. Now, eschatology doesn't, it's not necessarily going to come up as often as soteriology, salvation, yep. right? Because that's like, that's again, the tip of the spear. Um, but I do think that uh, again, because it affects, it's not even so much it affects the preaching ministry of the church in, in terms of doctrine. I think it affects the weekly ministry, the practical ministry mm. of the church. Um, if a church is like dispensational pre mill, what, what I've noticed is the, there's usually going to be a big emphasis on foreign missions, mm-hmm. global missions, mm-hmm. um, church planting, mm-hmm. which I'm, I, I like church planting. I'm down for that. I'm, I'm a church planter. I was a church planter. Sure. I've done it twice now. Um, you know, but those kind of personal evangelism, um, and then if a guy is post mill, like in my church, it's funny we have a, like a men's a monthly men's night, and and the, like we don't plan anything. I don't do a teaching. We just we just hang out and uh, and talk. And it's like three things that are always talked about. Not that I bring, but everybody else is bringing. We talk about economics and business. Uh, we talk about politics and we talk about theology. Mm. We've got like I've got a guy who's coming to our church right now. He's the mayor of his town. It's outside of our town. It's mm-hmm. a small town. There's twelve hundred people there, mm-hmm. but he's the mayor. Gosh darn it, and I love yeah. it. I'm glad he is. And so yeah. all that being said, the point is just um, the, the way that you do ministry as a church, When for our church right now, like there's a lot of people involved. We're thinking about starting a school, mm-hmm. and not just thinking. We're working towards starting a school. Um, and, and I'm not saying you can't do that as a premillennial. Of course you can. Sure. But I do think that like even down to the budget, when 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 you know me and, and my fellow elder, and then we're also congregational. The congregation votes on the budget annually and all the, those kinds of things. But when we're thinking as a church about what we're going to spend money on, mm-hmm. uh, what what ministries we're going to have in the life of the church, what our emphasis will be, our focus will be, uh, it, it, I think it's pretty different than a premillennial yeah. church. That's fair. That's fair. Okay. Uh, the, one of the biggest objections that uh, I comes up is Matthew 7, and I want to go over that, and then we're going to go to some exclusive uh, Patreon topics. Um, which is Matthew 7, verse 13, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So this, as you said, is one of the objections. People will view this verse and say, hey, what about this? This sounds like Way more people are on the road to destruction. How does this verse in this passage fit into this conversation? Yeah, great question. So what I would do is I would take Matthew 7. This was, by the way, this is a great one because it was my biggest hang-up. Okay. It really was. Um, I was I was really struggling with this. Um, so I would take this and I would cross-reference over to, I believe it's Luke 13. Yep. And so, so we're it's in Luke the same 13. kind of language. Yep. So, so Strive you know, to enter the narrow... The narrow door. <laughs> For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Um, when the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, and he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and taught in your streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see... Oh, We'll start there. In that place, 
um, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So stop, stop there for a second. So it's like there's this way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He mm-hmm. also says, I'm the door, I'm the good shepherd, like all these different uh, titles that Jesus gives for himself. But here we have like the way, Matthew 7, we have the door, Luke 13, but it's similar in the sense that it's saying narrow, narrow. Mm-hmm. And, and it doesn't just see it, say narrow, but it says few will ever find it in Matthew 7. And then the reverse is the same thing. In, in Luke 13, he says, uh, many will not enter. Many will not enter. And so, but the, here's the deal. It then goes on and says, <laughs> when you see, this is the second half of verse 28 now, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, so you'll be locked out of this wedding feast, this celebration, this thing that's going on. You didn't enter through the narrow door. Mm-hmm. Many of you didn't make it. Uh, but now you're going to see the people who did make it and kind of the, the the honored guests, the patriarchs at the head of the table, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. You yourselves are cast out. But who else is there? Verse 29 now. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. Upside down kingdom. Yeah. yeah. And so my point is like that language is like people are going to be coming from all over. And it sounds like it's not explicitly said, mm-hmm. but it sounds like people are going to be coming from all over and there's going to be a lot of people. Yep. There's going to be a lot of people. It, but but who are the few then? It's like, well, many won't enter. The door's narrow. Many yeah. aren't going to make it. Yeah. Well, who are the many that don't make it? It's the many of that generation in Israel. Mm. Jesus is, again, he's indicting this generation. He's mm-hmm. saying, narrow is the way, and few ever find it. He's talking to them. There's people right in front of his face. As he, we forget that. Mm-hmm. This is a simple thing that, that go a long way. All Scripture is for us. Not all Scripture is to us. Mm. That's good. There is an immediate audience for every passage in, in the Bible. And, and we ain't it. Yeah. You know, not yeah. all of life is about us, yeah. including including Christianity. Yeah. So it's all for us. All Scripture is God breathed. It's infallible, and it's useful for the man of God. Yeah. So so it's like I can be looking at this, and I'm like, yeah, man, there's some good stuff for me today, my life right now. It's for me. Yeah, but it's but not. It's but not it's not to you. To me, yeah. not yeah. directly to me. A buddy of my name, Ivy, who's also a post millennial, said that. Uh, he's speaking to to a lot of times that generation and, right. and or the Pharisees because in the very right. next verse it says in that very hour some Pharisees came right you know so that that, that this may be speaking specifically to to Pharisees yeah there. he's dissing the Pharisees all, all the time like yeah. saying like uh, and John the Baptist did the same thing when he was baptizing you at the Jordan yeah. River he says who warned you yeah. to flee from the wrath to come yep. You brood of vipers. Yeah, yeah. And then he says, even now, I, that's another post mill text, yeah. even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. What's he saying? He's saying, like, it's laid to the root of the tree, and 2,000 years from now, it'll cut? No, mm-hmm. no. He's saying, it's imminent. It's soon. Yep. Like, this tree is about to get chopped down. He's talking about 8070. He's talking, yeah. who warned you? This wrath is coming, a mm-hmm. local wrath, mm-hmm. local judgment on this nation, yeah. this generation, because they, they've hardened their hearts against the Messiah. He came to his own, they received him not. And God's about to deal with you and cut this off. And you guys, uh uh-uh, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So in this view, and was it, it was you said Jonathan Edwards, or who did you say where they said at the end there will be more people in going to heaven? So in this Charles view, Spurgeon said it, Charles B.B. Spurgeon, Warfield said yeah. it, a lot of guys. It's really good news. It's really good news. It's really good news. People, There'll be more people going to heaven, because when you read that verse, and the road is narrow and all right. that, you You're just right. think, well, hell is just, everyone's going to hell, and right. then there's a little small amount of people right. that are going to heaven. Right. But this is inversed in the post-millennial view. Yeah, most post-millennials believe that, uh, that not only the majority, not 51%, but that the vast majority of humanity will be saved. That's so and good. And people, here's the thing, people are like, that, okay, now you're just being crazy, Joel. And and this is the thing, though. Again, it's it's the longevity. So mm-hmm. it's not just um, optimistic versus pessimistic. It's also long versus short. Yep. Uh, what, and this, dude, this was another thing that rocked my world. Um, I heard Doug Wilson one time say, what if we're in the early church? Mm. Like what? What if you know it's like a thousand years to figure out doctrine of God? A thousand years, you know, doctrine of soteriology. Maybe the next thousand years we could work on Christian ethics. That'd, that'd be great, you know. And 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 keep pushing. But what if like two thousand years in, is like 
just the beginning. What yep. what if Jesus comes back in 80, 20,000? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like we got 18,000 more years to go, and we're only a tenth of the way in since his life. And it's like, all right, so, you know, if you're a young earth guy, which I am, you know, like, it's like, all right, we got about like 4,000 to 5,000 years before the incarnation, before Christ comes. Um, and then we've only had two, and, and, and there were some really bad things, but here's the deal, like, Christ came and that changed things. The world has progressively been getting better. We're only 2000 years in. What if it's a 20,000 year, you know, deal? And and here's here's the thing. It's one, it's not just the world gets better, lifespans and medicine and technology mm-hmm. and more just and all of that's the byproduct of more people loving Jesus. Mm. So it's the great it's the success of the great commission, which is to baptize the nations but also to teach them to, to obey, to obey Jesus' commandments. So if you know the world's getting better because people are getting saved, we don't just have more Christians today than we used to. We also have a higher percentage of Christians. Now, here's, here's the last thing. What if there becomes um, where all of a sudden, like right now, I would say if, if the clock stopped now, because people are like, more people in heaven, you're crazy. That's because you're thinking Jesus is coming back next Thursday. Mm. If Jesus came back next Thursday, I think that there would be 10, maybe even 100 times more people in hell. But if Jesus comes back in 20,000 years, mm. and and all of a sudden the, the gospel is more and more, the Great Commission more and more successful, more and more disciples made, them making disciples, making disciples, making disciples, and and people also having uh, having history, right? Like being able to look back on video, not just a few writings that we find from mm. Athanasius or this, but look on, back on video. We we we're a lot better at record keeping, mm. right? And and people being able to look back five thousand years from now and see, oh, look at how Christ. Yeah. It was actually Christian views that yeah. overcame communism and uh, socialism and poverty and this and and more and more people are like. Jesus is the way, the truth, yeah. and the life for things eternal, but also things here on earth. That, like this matter, and, and so take that and say, okay, what if all of a sudden it's like seventy percent, mm-hmm. and then eighty mm-hmm. percent of people are Christian mm-hmm. instead of non-Christian? And now here's the final piece: the be fruitful, multiply piece. What if the population, right? Because you think most people have been going to hell. Okay, but five thousand years ago, the whole world's population was maybe like a, a couple million people. Mm-hmm. Now it's eight billion. Right. Right. Well, what if, what what if ten thousand years from now, and the, and let's say ten thousand years from now, there's still ten thousand more years to go. What if instead of eight billion, what if it's a hundred billion, mm. and eighty percent of that hundred billion for ten thousand years is Christian is Christian. Yeah, it's good. Well, then heaven's a party. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What a trip. All right. We're gonna go to our Patreon exclusive. I gotta ask him some questions that are too spicy for YouTube. <laughs> We're gonna talk about. Christian nationalism. We're going to talk about aliens. You know, they don't want us talking about aliens. All right. And Nephilim. We're going to talk a a little bit about theomony and uh, we'll see where we go from there. So join us over on Patreon to get the remainder of this interview completely unedited over there because, you know, sometimes the YouTube's algos don't like us talking about this stuff. Okay. So, hey, real quick, you can watch the extended version of this podcast on Patreon. It gets a little spicy, it gets a little weird, like, I don't want to get pearly thing. So, if you want to see the entire thing, meet me over at Patreon, but here's a little preview. But, but my, it's my world is being rocked right now, Zach. But I thought I was conservative, right. man. Are most of the women at your church not working? So, like, I, I believe that, you know, that, that women should wear a head covering on the Lord's Day. But it's like... So, so all the women in your church got this on. Does your wife wear this on? Sunday? I said, you know what? I'm not going to apologize for slavery. I'm Whoa. not. So you don't think women should vote? No. Why? Sounds, They're shredding lightly with the vote. It sounds so intense, but I'm telling you, dude, you look back over history, think, you don't uh, have to agree with That's starting to sound a lot like Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other super controversial views of yours that I need to know? Well, so I was with, I was talking Gosh. with a guest. My heart's it's okay, sinking it's okay. right now. Okay. You're, you're anti-slavery, you don't like racism. I am anti- Bruce Lawn.